Shamima Sultana had always dreamt of starting her own poultry business. But with just $60 in savings and no assets, she was refused a bank loan. So she borrowed another $60 from a microfinance company and bought 300 chickens. That was 23 years ago. Now she earns several thousand chickens as well as cattle and has recently taken a new loan of $24,000. I went to many banks asking for loans, but kept getting refused. With Bureau Bangladesh, it was very easy, and they even delivered the money to my door. Microfinance companies charge between 19 and 27 percent interest, compared to 12 to 16 percent charged by most commercial banks. The companies say the higher rate is necessary to cover the costs of reaching remote areas. But the rates are capped by the government, and lenders have been tightly regulated since 2011. The entire spreadsheets, everything is monitored very strictly by our internal audit department, by MRA audits, by Bangladesh Bank audits, and the entire net surplus that we make is again, you know, reimbursed to the organization. The Bangladesh-based non-governmental organization BRAC says the default rate is 2%, lower than most commercial banks. If you look at the Bangladesh, uh, microfinance uh, industry, even today, 40 years on, the microfinance sector as a whole is growing at roughly 20% annually on a very large base. The portfolio at risks are still very low and manageable. But microfinance is not the only option for rural women. Across Bangladesh, many are turning to social enterprises to make money. Anissa Akhtar works as an info lady, someone who provides services, goods and advice to local women. She invested $65 with a company called iSocial and put down a deposit for a tablet and smartphone, which she uses to order products and do her research. Some of my customers have women-related illnesses, which they are uncomfortable sharing with doctors and even with family members, but they feel comfortable sharing them with me. As well as working from home, Anissa travels door-to-door, -door, earning $65 a month. Anissa is one of more than 400 info ladies working across Bangladesh and iSocial wants to increase that number to 10,000 within the next few years. The enterprise has attracted attention outside Bangladesh. Haiti has adopted the model and Nepal is planning to do the same. But the job isn't always easy. One of the biggest challenges that we face is um, uh, different social barriers, um, things like um, when um, um, parents or guardians wouldn't allow the uh, info ladies to join us because they would think what people, what other people would think or they, don't, they think going door to door is not respectful. Anissa has the support of her husband and mother-in-law. Like Shamima, she's lifted her family out of poverty and inspired thousands of women across the country. Shamim Chowdhury, TRT World, Tangail. Bangladesh. And Shamim's here in the studio with us. Uh, hey there, Shamim. Great report. Uh, really, really interesting story. Um, look, m let's talk about microfinance. It's been around for the best part of about 40 years, but it has been criticised because it's left actually a lot of people back in, in debt with huge amounts of debt. It has worked for some of the people that you featured in your report, but are these people the exception rather than the rule, do you think? Well, I think microfinance really has come a very long way since it start, since the concept came about uh, 40 years ago. It was actually pioneered in Bangladesh itself by an economist named, by the name of Mohammed Yunus, who uh, most people will be familiar with now. He won a Nobel Peace Prize for it, but there was no regulation in Bangladesh on microfinance schemes until 2011. And you're absolutely right, until that period, all sorts were going on. There were, it was basically tantamount to uh, loan sharks. But things really have changed. And when I spoke to uh, some of the organisations that are giving out these funds now, they're saying that they are very tightly regulated by the uh, Bangladesh Bank and by the government. They have to make all their audits accountable. This lady, in my report, as you say, uh, is a success story. I'm told it's about 10%, which is not bad, and the default rate is 2%. It's not in the interest of the lenders to have too high a default rate because then they can't continue what they're doing. Bear in mind also, Azar, that different forms of microfinance actually exist in the developed world as well. You have credit unions. We have them in West London, where I'm from. I've seen many of them. So this isn't something that is just uh, 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 you see just in the developing world. 
Credit in some form or other for those who are outside of the banking system actually exists everywhere around the world. And at this moment in time, it actually does seem to be working reasonably well in Bangladesh. And of course, it's been adopted by many countries around the world. Uh, so the key takeaway there is regulation, that microfinance works, but only when you have good regulation. Now, the other thing that you, interesting thing that you brought up in your report was the role of social enterprises. Um, now, they're a way of making money without necessarily getting into the kind of debt that microfinance necessitates. Um, but do they carry less of a risk overall than microfinance schemes? Not necessarily. There's less of a risk in the sense that they don't start off in debt. But getting into any kind of social enterprise, I mean, it's a social enterprise for all intents and purposes, is going into business. Now, in order to do that, as we saw in my report, the young lady, Anissa, had to put down a deposit. She had to uh, pay a fee to the, the organisation that she had joined forces with. She had to put down a deposit for her laptop and for her uh, smartphone. So you need a bit of cash to start off with. That's one thing. The other thing is with all businesses, it can fail. She may not get any customers. Nobody, she may find that nobody wants to buy her mm. products. And then, of course, she you know, is left without an income. The other risk is that if you are... With these social enterprise schemes, you're, the individuals are working alongside bigger companies. And how much cut do they take? Now, iSocial only take 10%. But I know of other uh, social enterprise organisations in Bangladesh mm -hmm. that will only pay their workers, if you like, or mm -hmm. the people who are carrying 10% or 12% right. or 15%. So there, there are definitely risks involved. Right. It's just an alternative model. Right. The, um, the other issue is NGOs. Uh, uh, Bangladesh is progressing up the um, income scale. How is that affecting the role of NGOs in Bangladesh? Well, this is actually... Uh, a very good point that you bring up. It, it is actually becoming a bit of a concern across Bangladesh. Bangladesh has for many years uh, been the recipient of N uh, NGO activities, um, like one of the biggest recipients in the world. Now, the World Bank has raised its status from uh, a least developed country to a lower middle income country. Now, statistics are all well and good, and they do count for something, but they're not the be-all and end-all. I mean, what needs to be remembered is that this is not a linear progress mm. you see across the city, uh, across the country. Right. You're going to get deprived areas, you're going to get remote areas, right. and they still very much need the assistance of NGOs. Just because their Bangladesh's yeah. overall status has been yeah. elevated, it doesn't necessarily mean that people's circumstances okay. have. Uh, Shamim, we're almost out of time, but we've got several other reports coming through uh, from you for the rest of the week. What are we looking forward to tomorrow? So tomorrow we're going to take a look at Bangladesh's pharmaceuticals industry which is doing very very well for the factors that I will discuss with you uh, tomorrow it's exporting to 140 countries it's met the needs of 98 percent of its right. population so that's what we can look forward to looking forward to it indeed Shamim Chowdhury thank you very much indeed